but you know, uh, you know, Elvis died in his house, and uh, you know, all these people they die off, you know, airplanes and everything. Nobody ever went down on stage. I think it'd be great. There's yeah. a rumor going on in Holland that you died. There is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's obviously true. It's obviously true. I mean, how can I fight that? You know, obviously, when I'm dead, I'm dead. So obviously, you know, I'm like. Uh, um, except it's daylight, so I can't say I'm a vampire. I, I you know, it's like uh, Night of the Living Dead. You ever see that? Did they have the film Night of the Living Dead? Yeah. Uh, it's Day of the Living Dead here. <laughs> you know, I sleep at night and walk around during the day. I'm obviously <laughs> dead, though. I will not dispute that whatsoever. Something is always happening, either visual or, uh, you, you know, whatever. Um, he, I can't think of another word, but anyway, hearing, visual, you know, whatever. Um, it's always there. So it's like I don't have the luxury in our show to, uh, let's say I do, uh, for instance, a song called All Revved Up with No Place to Go, and I'm going to follow that with Heaven Can Wait. I don't have the luxury of taking three or four minutes of recovering from <laughs> All Revved Up to go into Heaven Can Wait, which is a ballad. So sometimes they'll just sneak right out on stage. Nobody ever sees it, you know, and I'll do it so that I'm ready. It's like a, a, in, in football or uh, in America football. Uh, you know, a pass receiver goes out for a long pass, he runs 85 yards, they'll take him off the field, give him a shot of oxygen so he can run 85 yards again, which is completely dumb. Seeing as to the guy, that's all he does, all fans run down the field, you know, he never catches a pass. But, but uh, the line in the pace of the show is um, a necessary uh, function of that show. And that's what makes it different. That's what makes our show different than most rock and roll shows, is because you take almost every act that I know, they'll stop. We never stop. I never say a word to the audience. The first time I ever open my mouth to anybody is to Carl, and it's in conjunction with the characters speaking to one another. And after about an hour and a half, or an hour and 40 minutes, I finally talk to the audience. But when I talk to the audience, it's still part of the show. And so that's what makes our show really different. And that's another thing that has helped, too, is the show is so different. Uh, from a, from a rock and roll show, maybe people don't actually realize it. In other words, if you sit down and say, what makes Meat Love show different? They would go, well, uh, just Meatloaf, he's visual. Carla, she's real visual. But the real difference, besides being visual, is the pace mm -hmm. and the line of the show. And that's what makes it different. And people could not, probably not pick that apart and pick that out if they're watching it. They wouldn't understand that Billy Joel, he stops, that we don't, or that Springsteen stops, or that Seeger stops, or that Sticks, or whoever. They stop. We don't. Out of the band? Is that true? No, that's not true. I have not been out of the band. Uh, You're not I'm, going out of the band too. Pardon me. You're not going out of the band. No, too? I'm going to. I'm. I'm staying. She'll with never Meatloaf. look the same if she tries to leave. You know. <laughs> He'll kill me. No. Uh, really, my career has really pretty much been uh, started off, made, created, whatever, by being involved in Meat's project, and I really love it. And I'm going to be here for at least a couple more years until he kicks me out. <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah. Basically, Carl and I are the same boat. You know. My career basically started with me, too, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's like, you know, we're in the same... He's not leaving either. I'm not leaving either. It's, the rumor is not true. I am not leaving Meatloaf. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about it, but I decided it was not good, you know. Can you tell me something about the new album? Sure. What do you want to know? What's it going <laughs> to be? Something. Okay. No, it's, uh, again, written by Jim Steinman, our uh, man behind the scenes, our uh, eternal uh, crazy person who is, uh, uh, is afraid of... Uh, Success, but wants it really badly, you know, uh, so he's like uh, shell shocked most of the time and uh, You know he can't it's like uh, when we were you know, it's like uh, we were discussing for instance, you know, like uh, Jim we didn't want to copy anything we did from the first record because we don't have to necessarily so it's like paradise by the dashboard and light which was a uh, You know big a lot of places here in Holland Canada, you know um, well, we don't want to copy paradise so you know, Carl, we wanted to duet again with Carl, and we were having problems and things like that. All of a sudden, it happened. So, I think the album, the next album, as far as material on the record is concerned, is better material than this one. And everybody kept saying, "Well, I think it's getting a little dark." In other words, the new album was a little dark. But Jim Steinman writes dark. Everything's dark. Uh, it's like this very uh, dark kind of humor, yeah. very dark tongue in cheek, but also very. Uh, enlightening at the same time and hits things right on the head and nails it but it's very uh, uh, again innocent like paradise you know I mean we nailed he when he wrote that nailed exactly like uh, life in a in a car life in a in a field or you know teenage things and so he nails everything on the head and it has a tendency when read by Jim Steinman to be very dark 
but uh, with the thing that Carl and I will do on the next record, it's, called, it's a three-piece thing again, Stark Raving Love, called Dan and then a thing called Dance My Pants, which Carla sings, and into a, another thing called Lost Boys and Golden Girls. And it, it, it's, it's diff completely different than Paradise, uh, but it's a similar kind of thing because uh, Carla, uh, Carla, except the roles are reversed this time. Carla wants to make it, and I want to dance. You know, <laughs> so that you know, it's, so it's a different, it's a different, it's a different role. And uh, but everything, you know, I think the the working title of the record, which I think it'll be, is Renegade Angel, and which sort of fits in with Bad Out of Hell. And it's uh, people go, well, is it going to be similar? And I always say, well, it's similar to the fact that I'm singing lead vocals. Carla will be there. Some of the same people, Todd Rundgren, Jim Steinman writes the songs. But everything we do, no matter how it is, is different every time we do it. And uh, we try to, it's like uh, one of the best quotes I ever heard about us is if we ever figured out what we were doing, we'd be in big trouble. So I don't think we sit around and try to figure it out. It just sort of comes along and fits together like a puzzle. And we always hope that we can find the last piece to the puzzle. And uh, the song that Carl and I are going to do on the next record will be the, is, the, is the, the piece that finished the puzzle, and which turned everything around from being like seeming so dark into very... Hey, you know, that kind of thing. And it can be dark. Like, it's a very emotional thing. So Steinman's emotional. Everybody that uh, works with us is like some of the most sensitive people you ever meet in your entire life, you know, and uh, it has to be. Who's going to be the producer? Ah, uh, good, different question. Good. See, because before we ran out of film, we had to switch film, so we asked a new question. Who's going to be the producer? Todd Rundgren, once again. Another insanity person in our lives. I mean, the man's totally crazy, you know, but he's very bright. In uh, one sense, he's like Jim Steinman. He's uh, uh, really intelligent, very bright, and yet completely dumb. You know, it's like uh, they they know exactly what they're doing when they're on the levels where they're doing it, and they're the top people. But you get them off in some other areas. You know, it's like night and day. You know, this is the same guy I was working with before. But Todd is a um, Todd's a genius. You know, at what he does, and he's also a very underrated guitar player. And the thing that he does best of all is background vocals. Anybody who was ever in a background vocal session with Todd Rungwood would probably faint. You know, um, I almost did, only because I have no comprehension of harmonies whatsoever. <laughs> so, I mean, the white Todd Rungwood go, okay, uh, you sing this, da da da, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I had no idea. I'm going, I can't believe this guy. But um, th th he's unbelievable, you know, and I don't think that uh, we would have had the success with Bat if it hadn't been for Todd. You know that we've had, and I really, uh, really believe that. I mean, there's a lot of things that have made the success of Bat, but Todd is a really, he like structured everything for us when we needed to needed it to be structured at the initial foundation of what we were doing, as far as recording goes. It's that kind of innocence, and uh, uh, also on the lyrics on Paradise, it's like basically, uh, it is that communication, but it's also stems from. Uh, the uh, girl has the upper hand, you know what I'm saying? Because the girl has the product, <laughs> you know? The girl is the product that the guy's going after. So she's like, not necessarily selling it, but uh, you know, like auctioning it off. And in the song, it's like saying, hey, um, you know, hey, I want to do this. Well, you want to do this? Then you got to do this, you know, that kind of thing. So, so she it's can like say a business no. deal, you yeah. know? It's like a business deal. It's, you know, you give this, I'll give you this, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it's like, um, the um, thing on baseball. It's like a locker room turn. No, uh, in other words, um, athletes in America probably like athletes anywhere are the macho image of something. You know, like when you're in uh, school and you play uh, football or you play baseball or something. You know, that's the, that's the, pe the thing when you're in that, that age, the people look up to those people, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it. So it comes back to like locker room talk, which is a thing in America. It's like guys get in and go, I'm sure it's that way anywhere, only it's probably different. I don't know whether it's locker room talk in Holland or whatever. I've never uh, experienced locker room talk in Holland yet. Maybe Soccer I will. Talk well. or something. You know, and uh, it's the same thing. So um, I'm thinking about going for Christmas, actually. I've been sitting around going, I think I want to go to Holland now. You know, I mean, I, it's like, uh, seems wonderful. But the success came after the film. Has it been the same in other countries? Oh, yeah. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England. Uh, not so much America, because America doesn't. I actually think they're behind, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. You know, it's like, uh, or else they're, uh, they see so much product, they're bored with it and don't know when something, uh, you know, really stands out when it's a piece of work or whatever, you know. Uh, 
I, but I think America's behind, actually, because I think that's, um, that's how things really should be exposed and through good films. But they see so many bad films, you know, it's like everybody, because uh, necessarily artists don't necessarily know sometimes, uh, like, uh, how to use a film properly, because it's like three different things, you know, there's a recording, then there's live, and then there's film. And it's like so many bands said, uh, well, I can't show a film on my live concert because nobody will come to the live concert. Uh, film is another aspect, uh, which makes people want to come to the live concert more, I think. And it's all in how you use it, you know? It's like an illusion. Film is an illusion. And if you use it as an illusion, mm -hmm. then it it's more fun. Because uh, you, you get to do a lot more on film. And you get to do a lot less, too, you know? But it's, it's, uh, you get to do more facial, more things like that. I mean, I do them live, but when you're dealing with 15,000 people, the uh, 14,001 back there doesn't really necessarily see it, he only feels it, which is good too. So that's, that's a live thing, is to feel it, and film is a visual, and, uh, and uh, records are hearing. So it's like three different senses. The uh, paradise, but a desperate life. <laughs> uh, I've only been in the airport, you know, in Amsterdam. Did so. you like the airport? Yeah, I bought these little shoes, you know, these little wooden shoes, you know, I loved it. And uh, I was going to buy big wooden shoes, you know, but they were like hard to carry, so I just bought little ones. And um, no, and it's like I always wanted, I kept trying to tell everybody when we were in Europe, I said, I want to play, I want to play Holland, I want to play Holland. People kept going, well, nobody will put you in Holland. I went, well, somebody's got to want us in Holland, you know. Come, we gonna, we, first we're going to play Holland, and no, nah, you're not going to play Holland, they don't want you, you know. So I just went, well, that's okay, you know, we'll play there eventually. Yeah, because we can't really get there before then. Because uh, the, uh, I know they want us there now. In fact, you know, it's like I read this telegram today that offered me so much money. I'm going, I don't want to hear about it because I want to go. But uh, uh, money's not the foremost thing in my mind, never has been. I want to finish this record, you know. I mean, to Holland, it's new, but to uh, New York, it's a year and a half old, you know. So I have to finish the new record, get that out. And we're going to tour a little bit here just to fortify what's going down here in the States. And then I'm going to Europe because it's a blitz. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, you know, because I'm going over to Europe to stay for a while. Okay. And so I'll do quite a few in Holland and, you know, all over everywhere. And then I go on over to Australia. Then I come back and we start working on a film called Neverland. And that's it. Uh, in 83, I'm going to do, and, uh, you know. You know. <laughs> okay, thank you too for this conversation. Case, our pleasure. Thank you, Here Holland. Here we are. Thank you, Holland. Thanks a lot. It's Thanks. great, really. It's a little improv on our part, you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, welcome to Meatland. Welcome to Meatland. Bye, Bye, Holland. I would blow you a kiss, but I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Well, really. I do. Okay, go for it.